Uh, so this session will be in English. Uh, the title is How to Transform Research-Oriented Code into Machine Learning API with Python. The speaker is uh, called Jesse. He's from Japan. And let's welcome him to give the talk. Hello, everyone. I'm Jesse, working at Class G, which is an ed tech company based in Tokyo. I mostly work in both data science and engineering and have been developing a recommendation system. So based on my experiences, I'm going to talk about how I transformed research-oriented code into machine learning APIs with Python. So the reason I'm going to talk about these topics is because recently Python engineers have more opportunities to work with data scientists and researchers than before. And understanding the processes to develop ML APIs can help make AI ML projects work more smoothly. So the target audiences might be engineers who is working with data scientists or researchers who are involved with AI ML projects. And this topic seems to be broad and a big topic. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the processes to develop ML APIs. So there are four steps to transform research-oriented code into ML APIs. So understand research-oriented code and modularize it, refactor it, and the right the code to check if the code can work correctly. The first step is to understand the research-oriented code. So I'm going to answer these questions. What is a research-oriented code? What are ML APIs? and how should engineers handle research-oriented code. So I will use a flask in sample code in this talk. So let's look at definition. Research-oriented code in ARML project is the code written mainly by data scientists or researchers for figuring out the most efficient and suitable machine learning model. So machine learning APIs are composed of three elements. Basically, researchers focus more on writing pre-processing code and machine learning code. And the research-oriented code is developed through an iterative process and integrated into production code. On the other hand, engineers have more have responsibility to write whole part of the code in production level. So this is an example of data pre-processing code written by researchers or data scientists. So this function seems to be long, but this code uses empty list and a for loop and if, if and also. But this can allow researchers or data scientists to visually trace the code from the top to the bottom and easily and quickly write it. This is an example of ML code written by data scientists or researchers. This code uses logistic regression, and there is a calculation function on the top. And this code uses data frame and dot pen. But this code makes it possible for researchers or data scientists to easily handle input data and trace output data with data frame. So this code is refactored by engineers. So this code seems to be shorter than previous code. And there are simple calculation functions on the bottom. And this code uses empty li uh, list comprehension, set comprehension. So actually, this code can build the model in a much faster and a simpler way. So now I identify three differences between research-oriented code and production code. So there are different scopes of each between them and different characteristics of coding styles and different objectives of coding styles. The researchers focus more on writing pre-processing code, ML code. On the other hand, engineers have responsibility to write the whole part of the code in production level. And research-oriented code seems to be easily handled and visually traceable. But production code needs to be considered about high correction speed, high readability, and they are testable and modular. This is because researchers Focus finding the most efficient and suitable machine learning model. And engineers have to make the code work on the server correctly and reliably. reliably. 
So now, what are Python engineers supposed to do for research-oriented code? So modularize the research-oriented code into preparation code, preprocessing code, and ML code, and then refactor them, and then write the code to check how it can work correctly. So second step is to modularize the code. So there are three small three steps. First of all, categorize research-oriented code into preparation code, preprocessing code, and ML code. And secondly, break them out into functions and make them testable. And then finally, clarify input and output of the code and define URI. So there is a page of sample research-oriented code uh, written with Jupyter Notebook. Uh, this code is written for calculating probabilities to get the student's correct answer for certain questions of exam. So this code is procedural, and some of them are not classified, so it could be harder for us to understand the role of each code. So, but actually, I wrote it, uh, but I, I struggle with it. So the res research-oriented code, uh, this code seems to be tightly coupled, so in order to categorize this code, find the code to load input data or access database, it can be categorized as preparation code. And then find the code to make, replace, filter, or delete input data, it can be pre-processing code. And then find the code to execute calculation or train data, it can be categorized ML code. So now I could categorize research-oriented code into preparation code, preprocessing code, and ML code, like the table on the slide. At the same time, we could get modules for each from one page of research-oriented code. So preparation.py has functions to replace, <coughs> uh, Preparation.py has functions to access BigQuery, execute query, and load input data, and rename columns. Preprocessing.py has functions to replace categorical data with discrete numbers and filter data. So Prediction.py has functions to calculate parameters, logistic regression, and item response theory. So item response theory is also called as two parameters logistic regression. This is used for calculating probabilities to get students correct answer. So this statistical method is used mainly for, uh, mainly in uh, pedagogical domain. So now we can see the research oriented code uh, become loosely coupled. So Third, clarify input and output of the whole code and define the URI. So there is a table of input data on the left side on this slide, uh, which is used for two parameters, logistic regression. And on the left side, there is a table of output to data, calculated by model. So the input data is about whether students answer each question correctly or not. So their item name, item means a question. Uh, their item name, which is a uh, name of question, item ID, how difficult each question is, uh, subject names, exam name, and the correction, which is the binary data. On the other hand, output data is about probabilities to answer que questions correctly. So the role of the API is to get probabilities. So we can directly label probabilities as an endpoint name. So based on best practices, functional name should be above or above plus noun. So the role of this function is to calculate results or get probabilities. So we can label calculate results or get props at the functional name. So what I want to say here in this slide is understanding what data is input and output, which means understanding what data the code calculates and makes is an important step to make API. So now we could create a skeleton of the ML API modularized from a page of research-oriented code. So now we can move to refactoring phases. 
but we need to prepare for refactoring first. And there are two main parts of refactoring, which are I.O. and Pandas code. So let's look at these processes in more detail. So I did not include refactoring of ML code because ML code which is integrated into products tend to be short and there might not be a species to rewrite or fix. So before starting with refactor, we might need to understand more about the code. So in order to narrow down requirements of each code, write test code and take notes of our requirements of each code. So there are directories which I modularized in previous slides. API directory has app.py features endpoint to get probabilities and the config file, prediction.py, preparation.py, and preprocessing.py. So test directory has four modules of test code for each. <coughs> So when taking notes in the code, you can use sharp comment out or duck strings. Uh, there are four kinds of duck string, such as restructured text style, NumPy style, Google style. So you can choose one that you like. I prefer to use the Google style because other styles have parameters instead of arguments. I feel more comfortable for using uh, arguments instead of parameters. So after we wrote test code and understood more than 70% or 80% of requirements of each code, we can finally start to refactor it. So I'm going to show you a case study with refactoring the code to access BigQuery and GCS by using Google Cloud client libraries with Python. So there are two kinds of uh, code on this slide. The code A uses a star and extract all of data from data set and output two dimensional arrays. So the code B has a role to extract three specific kinds of data from data set, only one column one is not known. So the query filters values and drop now. So I suggest that you process the data with query as much as possible if you use BigQuery. This is because it is faster and low, lower cost than pre-processed data with Python. The cost and the processing speed of the BigQuery is depending on the amount of data processed. So now, when writing preparation code to access GCS, I suggest that you make bytes object and upload it from memory to GCS with Python. I tended to write the code to make CSV files on local and load it and upload it from local PC to GCS because this is because it allows me to quickly write the code. So as a result, a large amount of CSV files sometimes stay in local PC and consume extra memory of PC. So I suggest that you make bytes object. But however, this code on this slide seems to be long. So I should simplify more by developing or using a wrapper library. So there are two kinds of code with Google Client Library which I showed in the previous slides. So it combines and it simplifies two kinds of codes. In so doing, it reduces the total amount of code. The GCP accessor is a package I developed. So after this talk is finished, please speak with me if you have an interest in packaging. So now we can transform coding style with pandas into coding style with pure Python in processing, pre-processing code. So all data in the API should be processed using the same data type. So this can, might improve the readability and maintainability as opposed to prioritizing the processing speed. So one day I wondered why I struggle so much with refactoring of pre-processing code in research-oriented code that I wrote previous week. 
The reason that uh, there are many coding styles with Python, as you can see on the table, for example, filter function has six kinds of coding styles. So I think there are more than I wrote here. So in case of coding style with Python, it just uses basically list comprehension in each function. So Pandas is very powerful and useful for data wrangling, but as a code might decrease the readability depending on situation and depending on how you use. So the way of coding without pandas could be easier for engineers to read the code and it could increase readability and maintainability. So last step is to write the code to check if the code can work correctly. So there are two things to do. Write decorators to check parameters and set up production-like environment. <coughs> So this is the image of decorators in APIs. After client send the request, APIs check whether parameters are correct or not, and check access token. So if something wrong with the code happens, error handler will catch the error. If there's nothing wrong with the code, a request will reach to the endpoint. So I don't have enough time to describe all of them, so I'm gonna focus on talking about request parameter check. So I'm gonna show you an example of request parameter check with JSON schema. This request car command has student name and the student grade as a parameters. This JSON file is a sample JSON schema which I wrote in this file, you can define what data should be checked and how the data should be checked. So this make name grade.json file is defining the data type of student name as string, and it must be included as a request parameters. And the data type of student grade is also defined as string, and it must be included as a true. And the maximum length of characters is limited in 120, and minimum length is one character. So in this example, request parameters are not allowed to be empty. So based on JSON schema, the JSON validate.py validates request parameters. The first validate JSON function checks whether the JSON schema exists or not the second validate schema function checks whether the request parameters are correct or not based on JSON schema defined in previous slides. So in order to execute these functions, write function name as a write a function name as a syntax sugar under the endpoint. This JSON validation code already exists on the web. I mean, there are a lot of sources about this code. So I look over JSON validation code on the web. Most of the code are like this on the, on the slide. So I just referred it from the stack of overflow. So there is a variable discussion in this URL. You can check it later. So finally, uh, set up production-like environment with Flask. So they are just tools, so I do not talk about how to use them in tutorial, so I just show you options. So first, set up visualization tools such as Tableau, Google Data Store, Redash, or Looker. When trying to automate continuous integration, GitHub and Sakushi CI and PyTest might be common options. So after setting up CI environments, you can deploy on GCP. So these might be a typical options, I think, for ML APIs, as some of you might already know. So, but I suggest that you also look up frameworks based on Flask, such as Flask Up Builder, Dash, and the Locust. Flask Up Builder allows you to manage and visualize data, and Dash can make it possible to interactively communicate with data. The low cast is low test two, which can also allow you to do scenario test. 
So there are already a lot of resources about the tool on the web and the tutorials are already presented in the past PyCon around the world. So you can look over them by yourself later. So I'm gonna share this slide on my Twitter. If you have an interest in it, you can follow me and look over it later. So let me quickly summarize the four steps to transform research-oriented code into ML APIs. First, understand what is a research-oriented code and what are ML APIs and how to handle research-oriented research code. And modularize them and refactor them and then write the code to check if the code can work correctly or, and set up production-like environments and check uh, how it can behave. So thank you so much. Uh, if you have any interest in how I'm refactoring in the EdTech domain or in what our team is doing, feel free to talk to me later. Thank you so much. Oh, you mean uh, after APIs was created, how difficult researchers read APIs? Mm, I do not image that researchers or data scientists check production code after APIs was transformed. I mean, research oriented code was transformed. So, yeah, I think in my case, um, after I developed API, ML APIs, I'm gonna ask data scientists or researchers to check uh, a part of code, such as ML code or yeah, preparation code. Is it, did I answer this question? Mm, kind of, yes. Kind of? I think if, if anyone has any follow-up question, Uh, another question uh, provided just now. Usually, how large the copays needs to be reworked to be in production? Sorry, would you please tell me? Uh, yeah, so actually, the screen was just the question. Uh, so, how large oh. normally the copays need to be reworked to be in production? The, let's say, from the research code to the API. How large code does need to be worked? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, I think this is my future work because actually in my company I'm only one Python engineer, so I do not have experiences to work with uh, a lot of data scientists or engineers, so yeah, I cannot answer that because I did not experience. The question is also related to that. Uh, it say like, uh, if I'm trying to convert research code, how would you suggest that the time frame in man hour? Uh, yes, in case of agile, I think two months or three months could be a time frame in total. And then, if you also engineers and the as well as you are researchers or data scientists, um, yeah, you can quickly develop APIs. Right. Uh, the new, okay, we have one more new one. Do you think serverless like AWS Lambda is a good way to deploy ML models? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it depends on the situation, the project. But um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the AWS Lambda, so. Yeah, I cannot answer this question correctly. 
So I think we still have five minutes. So if uh, there's anyone want to ask question directly, please uh, maybe raise the hand and turn on the microphone in front of you. You can ask directly. I have a question about uh, how you test your uh, machine learning model. Because would you compare the researcher code with your production code and try to see if the result being the same, or what? How how do you test it? How do I test? Yeah, how do you test your machine learning model? You, you have two versions, right? One is written by researcher and the other one is your refactored results. Mm -hmm. And how would you prove your uh, refactor one is still being the same with the original one? Oh, I think other, other person check, I guess. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Would you, would you ask me the same question again? I, I'm sorry, I could not get. I'm just wondering, because during the refactoring, how do you prove uh, your new refactored uh, result You mean, uh, is you the mean same the after I refactored the research oriented code, and who is going to check this code? Or in what kind of aspect in, would you test it? What kind of role? Uh, I mean, uh, what kind of person will you check? This code, we factor the code. Yes. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah, of course, the engineer, because, you know, engine after uh, this code is written by engineers, so I think engineers will check because engineers, as I, as I said, as I show in the, in the slide, engineers have a responsibility to work on the server correctly and reliably. I think engineers have to uh, check the whole part of the code in production level. But uh, I think this way is depending on company, so it depends on person. But uh, in my case, yes. Uh, okay, we have two more minutes. Any questions? I actually have one more. Okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. So, so what's the best timing for you to migrate, like converting the core to uh, the API? When did you decide to do that? When did you decide the block API? Yeah, after, I mean, when did you decide to uh, move to the API, move the original research code to API code? When? Yeah. After researchers finished writing <laughs> research oriented code. So, so basically, you, you finish the research, you approve, you pr approve everything, and you just move to production yeah. and never come back the person, to. Personal engineers should have responsibility to. Yeah. For the whole part of the code in production level. Right. Oh, I see one more question on the side. Okay. Uh, if model has a good evaluation result but not work efficiency on production, how to solve? Well, in my case, I'm gonna, yeah, engineers also um, have responsibility to write whole part of the code, I said, but uh, in this kind of case, uh, I'm gonna ask researchers or the data scientists to recheck what they wrote. Okay. I th we have still have time. Any questions? No. Okay. Yeah, I think it should be fine now. Okay. Uh, thanks for Jesse's talk. And I will bring Jesse out of outside. So if you have any question, want to ask him offline, uh, welcome. Uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs>